Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm proud to welcome again, for I believe the fourth time to the Power Hungry Podcast, Chris Kiefer, Dr. Chris Kiefer. Welcome back, Chris. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here, Robert. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I'm going to have you introduce yourself again. I always do that, even though you've been on before. But uh, we're going to talk about Pickering and the fact that just this week, in fact, on Wednesday, uh, which would have been September 28th, Ontario Power Generation announced they're going to extend the life of the Pickering nuclear plant, which there are several de details on that. But before we get to that, if you, uh, you know the drill here, you just arrived somewhere, you just arrived in a new emergency room and no one knows you there. Introduce yourself, please. I'm going to keep it really brief uh, for those listeners who've already met me uh, via your excellent podcast, Robert. But um, I'm going to start off the way you do. I am the very proud father of a beautiful almost four-year-old. Uh, as you mentioned, I am an emergency physician. Uh, I'm the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy, which is relevant to today's conversation, the host of the Decouple podcast, and all around great guy, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that gets it. That That is a good summary. So I got to tell you, congratulations. I know uh, that a lot of people worked on saving uh, the Pickering nuclear power generating station in uh, in Ontario, but you were uh, part of that movement. And uh, this announcement by uh, the Ontario government that they're going to save the plant is more evidence, I think, of one, this, the, the change in focus, success of nuclear in the public mind. Well, tell me what, how you view this. What, uh, how happy does this make you? Give me the typical journalist question. How do you feel, Mr. Dr. Kiefer? How do you feel about this? Well, Robert, I've, I've been pinching myself, honestly, these last two days, um, just to make sure this isn't a dream. Because, you know, two years ago, when we started this movement to save the Pickering Nuclear Station, this was one hell of a long shot. You know, I'm not a gambler, um, but I gave us one in a million odds. I was very inspired by uh, Izuru um, and Dietmar down in New York um, with their campaign to save Indian Point. Um, I think that was a big turning point for me, certain, certainly strengthened um, my desire to throw myself into this battle. Despite it basically being too late in New York, they did absolutely incredible work, um, created amazing documentation, reports, et cetera, um, and really made the environmentalists who helped shut Indian Point down pay the price of the reputation, documented the skyrocketing emissions and natural gas use. Um, so, you know... Um, that was that was a big part of this journey. Um, that one in a million odds we started with. Um, was, it, was, and, it that, was it that long? Do you think, Chris? Honestly, there was one in a million. I oh, mean, I mean, everybody told us this was hopeless. You know, and I mean, we we were looking around had for been allies, made and that there was no yeah. backing down, and that this was a done deal, and that all of the remaining six reactors right at Pickering were going to be shut. Right. That that was the plan. That was the plan. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, our band of merry men and women um, in Canadians for Nuclear Energy, you know, made a decision that this was going to be our central focus and very generous of those of us outside of Ontario to do. But I mean, what's good for Ontario nuclear is, is good for the whole country. Um, and yeah, I mean, God, where to start? You know, we started a, a, with some folding uh, tables, uh, some homemade pamphlets and even just doing that, it did get the attention of the utility on Tower Ontario Power Generation. And I have to give them enormous credit. Um, they have come around fully on board um, with the plan, not only to extend the plant, but to seriously explore and make possible refurbishment in another 30 years of operation. If you remember, Ro uh, Ro um, Robert, Jesus, <laughs> if you remember, um, you know, can -dos have a lifespan of, you know, at least 60 to 80 years. There's nothing to say we can't refurbish them even longer. Um, you know, a second refurbishment, I don't see any reason why that's not technically possible. I haven't explained why it wouldn't be. But, you know, most can-dos around the world, um, you know, built in the 70s, 80s, and 90s are up for a midlife refurbishment. The the critical piece of um, the plant that needs to be replaced is the pressure tubes. You can think of the, you know, the PWR, the, the BWR, the standard light water reactors like a pressure cooker with a big chunk of fuel um, inside that inside that pressure cooker. And, and can do is a really different design. Um, you know, heavy water is the moderator. It lets us use natural uranium. We burn dirt and luckily it's Canadian dirt. So, you know, supreme energy security. 
Um, a really ingenious design that does even more than, you know, carbon free, reliable, always on affordable energy. It also produces medical isotopes. So we had so many reasons to fight for this. But, you know, again, at the very beginning, um, the utility contacted us and said, listen, you know, this isn't good for the nuclear industry. Pickering's a done deal you to shut up that you were you're being too vocal. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, that's not out of step, I think, with a lot of utilities around the world, particularly utilities that, you know, have nuclear as well as other assets, um, you know, in their in their portfolio. Um, and, you know, we're mostly nuclear and hydro. We do have some gas. The plan um, from our uh, independent electricity systems operator was to replace Pickering with gas. And, you know, again, those odds, I think, started kind of one in a million. But as you're aware so much has happened in the last two years in terms of this emerging global energy crisis. And, you know, the assumptions when the plan was made not to pursue refurbishment, because this is what's interesting. Um, there was actually a regulator approved plan to refurbish the Pickering nuclear station in 2009. But what was going on at that time? We had the global financial crisis. We had deindustrialization, big drop in forecasted power demand. We had historically cheap natural gas coming online because of the fracking revolution. Um, and finally, gas was cool. You know, um, we had coal on our grid then. Gas was lower carbon. Um, thank God we use nuclear instead of gas um, to power through our coal phase out. We're one of the only jurisdictions in the world that basically made coal illegal. Um, and we did that again uh, with 90% of the energy was from nuclear energy, from restarts of mothballed reactors um, to get us up to the full strength um, that we're at now. And it looks like we'll be running at that full strength into the 2060s, uh, really because of the vision um, of of this government. And I have to take my hats off to them. Well, it is a big it is a big change, and I agree with you. And it was one of the things I. Uh, this seems to me that I mean I would say even in the last two months, um, this there's been a significant shift globally around attitudes toward nuclear. Right, Western Europe being obvious and one of the obvious examples. Boris Johnson saying we're going to build a reactor a year. Well, Boris is gone, but nevertheless, the the, the, yeah. the governments across Europe saying that they're going to pursue nuclear avidly because they they're of their uncertain gas supply situation. Um, and then here in the U.S., uh, I can you know you know these as well as I do, but I'll just repeat them very quickly. That Holtec International, which bought Palisades, the nuclear plant in Michigan, announced that they're in, even though the plant was shuttered in May and thought to be for good. They just in the last few weeks said, no, we're going to keep this plant open. We want to keep it open and we're seeking federal funding to do so. Uh, Dow, one of the mo perhaps the most interesting of all of these, I think, is Dow, uh, the big chemical company, saying they, they're they planning to build an, a small modular reactor at, at their petrochemical complexes in the in the Texas or Louisiana Gulf Coast. This yeah. is a very old line, very conservative chemical company, and they're signaling to the market, we think SMRs are ready for prime time. Um, mm -hmm. So you have uh, those moves, the, the vote on Diablo Canyon. Uh, all of these together, I think, are really are, are, are part of this shift uh, that is a, a, a sea change in terms of attitude about nuclear and then uh, propelled, I think, as well, of course, by uh, Russia, Ukraine and the, and the high price of natural gas. I don't know what TTF is today, $55, something like that, which is yeah. a very yeah. high price when, in, you know, 24 months ago, was it, you know, three single digits. Um, but let me just get a, a couple of quick things out of the way here because I want to make sure that the people who are listening. Ontario Power Generation is the utility that controls the the electricity in uh, in Ontario, and so that's publicly the province, the provincial government uh, is, is is the controls OPG. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's a, you know we did have a deregulation where we carved off transmission from generation. We used mm -hmm. to be Ontario Hydro, and mm -hmm. Ontario Hydro is who had the vision to build these massive nuclear plants. You know, don't forget that we have the largest operating nuclear station in the world. That's Bruce Power. That's eight um, eight hundred and eighty megawatt reactors all on one site. Pickering, um, only six of the reactors are running, but that was eight 500 megawatt reactors. And we have Darlington Station, which has four, uh, almost 900 megawatt reactors. So, you know, this was the age of public power um, when we were doing things right. We knew how to build. We knew that building the same design, you know, plant after plant, right next door to each other, learning lessons from construction. Um, and we did great. And I mean, Pickering was built um, on budget and on time. 
Um, you know, there was some controversy around Darlington. It was unfortunately built, um, well, during the time of Chernobyl. It was put on hold for a couple of years when interest rates were 15, 20%. And we unfortunately had a um, uh, government on the political left that uh, lost its enthusiasm. So that plant did go over. But, you know, we really uh, did things right. But yes, you're right. Ontario Power Generation um, is the sole shareholder is the government of Ontario. And so, you know, and when we phased out coal. Really, and that's really key here, I think, yeah, is that, you, yeah. know, you know, the difficulty in the U.S. has been that, well, New York Power Authority sold Indian Point to Intergy for a song, right? And yeah. that the public ownership of these assets, and I'm all about public, I love co electric cooperatives. I think that public mm. power, public ownership of public, of, of critical energy infrastructure is very important. And I'm ad absolutely in favor of it. Not opposed to investor-owned utilities, but having the people own stakes in these critical projects, I think is important. But I just want to make sure we point out that, so I was looking at the uh, OPG website and also uh, CBC um, so they said uh, OPG, the Ontario Power Generation, said that they are seeking uh, app approval from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to continue operating Pickering's units five through eight. So four reactors through September of 2026, which is a one year extension. And mm -hmm. then they're saying that they're going to go ahead with the retirement of units one and four uh, at the end of 2024. So they're saying they're going to re retire two and keep four. Or is that, is that up to date what OPG is saying? What's the st current situation? Yeah, it sounds kind of reminiscent of Germany in a sense, keeping two and, and trashing one, but it's very different. Um, again, you know, there's eight units at this plant. The A side was built in the 70s. Um, two of those units were refurbished in the early 2000s. They have a good 10 years of life in them still under our, the, our estimation of the experts from our group. Um, you know, they are harder to refurbish again. Um, so, you know, our hope would be that the, the B side is refurbished for another 30 years and, you know, this is getting highly technical, but the A side is dependent on some, uh, safety system from the B side. You know, we're hopeful that we'll get the refurbishment and then we you know we're never done. You know, as crazy nuclear advocates, we never give up. We'll start fighting for the A side <laughs> and get those two guys going for, you know, their full lifetime. We should, should squeeze that out of them. Um, we certainly need the power. Um, Ontario is pursuing uh, a real electrification goal with electric vehicles, uh, but also a lot of our steel industry is, is transitioning into electric arc furnaces. Mm -hmm. um, just at one facility, those those furnaces will put a 300 megawatt baseload draw on the grid. So, you know, there is a severe uh, supply and demand mismatch that's brewing. And I think that's part of what's behind uh, the government's decision. I just did want to follow up, you know, this, this, you know, the Ontario government owning being the sole shareholder in OPG um, means that they have had the power to do some pretty extraordinary things. And one of those was to make coal burning illegal in Ontario. That was by government uh, fiat or dictate, right? We were only able to do that because we'd had enough nuclear. And, you know, it's interesting. We'd had pro-nuclear and anti-nuclear governments and the amount of coal that was being burned was directly proportionate, obviously, to, you know, more units being online and some units coming off. You know, the 1990s were not a good decade for nuclear. Again, we had governments that were not supportive, that were not putting in uh, the right amount of investment. Uh, Mark Nelson did a great show with us on what the hell's going on with the French nuclear fleet, where half of it's down during this right. critical energy crisis. Yeah. You know, there's a good side to government ownership, but if you get an anti-nuclear government, you know, you have what happened to us in the 90s. That's when coal really went up. You know, um, you have what's, what's happened in France and, you know, to some degree, South Korea was set back, you know, during the uh, the uh, presidency of, of uh, President Moon. So, you know, there's a bit of a double edge sword nuclear is tricky right because even the utility people say well the nuclear industry this and that the only nuclear industry that there is especially in the west where we're not really building much is the decommissioning industry is sort of the safety upgrade industry there's not really you know a power there right you know there's utilities that run nuclear plants they're not particularly committed to them they don't really care and, and so you know really, i've been saying really the, have... the kind of and they don't really have a locus of power geographically. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the key differences between Canada and the U.S. Is that mm -hmm. in Ontario, you have this concentration of nuclear industry, nuclear jobs. Mm -hmm. that, uh, OPG mm -hmm. is saying that saving the plant will, will be protecting 4,500 jobs. That's a lot of jobs. Um, but that here in the U.S., we have a, more nuclear plants than any other country in the world. But they're diffused geographically. So mm -hmm. there's no there's no 
geographic uh, congressional delegation that is in favor of nuclear, right? It's because it's all spread out, unlike the coal industry, right? Which right. Wyoming, Kentucky, uh, uh, or the oil and gas industry, Texas, New Mexico, uh, 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 Louisiana, uh, New Mexico are all big oil and gas producing states, and they're going their delegation in Congress is going to represent those industries. But mm -hmm. we don't mm -hmm. have that in the nuclear sector, which I think is one of the reasons why they're they've been so ineffectual. Uh, and now they're they're making gains in the U.S., but it's not nothing like the locus of power and concentration of jobs, capital, and government involvement that you have in Ontario. And I think that that's what makes the Canadian story so interesting. And, and, and frankly, for, you know, what you've been able to do and, and, and move government to understand, no, you need to save these assets. These are critical for a lot of reasons, and not just CO2 jobs, you know, energy security, all of these things that I think came together now. And it's, I mean, but it's got to feel so, uh, gratifying to go to go to war on this and and get and turn government i mean that's how i see it that you that that what that's what you and your colleagues at canadians for nuclear energy did is, is, is that rhyme with what you think you know i'm blushing but i do think so um as i said everybody said well not everybody but you know the utility government folks we talked to other folks in industry um we're all you know, not happy with us pursuing this. Again, they said this was bad for the nuclear industry in Canada because we were fighting for this, you know, outdated station. Um, you know, there'd be a lot of public opposition to it. Um, you know, we should just focus on supporting the new SMR build at Darlington. And we said, you know, that SMR build at Darlington is great. Huge export opportunities. We're, you know, a center of nuclear excellence, a tier one nuclear nation, a tier one nuclear province, for God's sakes. This is good. Um, but we need to hold up a shield, you know, where we're most vulnerable. Um, and, you know, Pickering brings enormous benefit, as you said, 4,500 jobs, right? Within the broader context of 76,000 jobs here in Ontario, highest union density of any sector, something like 90%, you know, six figure incomes to tradespeople, STEM professionals. Every dollar that we invest in uh, our can-do refurbishments gets a dollar forty back in in GDP and economic activity, and I mean that seems a bit mind-boggling. But let me let me make the comparison because I'm going to posit to you, Robert, that Ontario has the most pro-nuclear government in the Western world right now because they just made a big decision, right? There was a kind of path dependency to sleepwalk into natural gas, um, replacing this nuclear station. Now, what would the implications of that been for the people of Ontario? We would have been buying a bit of gas from out west. You know, we only have one little pipeline bringing gas from Saskatchewan and Alberta. We would have been buying a lot of gas from the U.S. Right. Right. I mean, this is this is like Europe. It's like sending your dollars away overseas. Right. Um, you know, help the frackers out in Pennsylvania, but doesn't do anything for us. So we right. would import gas, which is getting increasingly expensive, you know, competing with the Europeans now, competing with the international LNG market. Um, and you generate, excuse my language, but fuck all jobs right here in Ontario. You know, a uh, five, 600 megawatt gas plant can run on 30, 40 employees. Right. Right. At our nuclear plants, the parking lots, I mean, again, because these are multi unit sites, two, 3,000 spots at some of these, at some of these facilities. So nuclear is cheap uranium and well paid jobs, a lot of them. And when that benefit all accrues locally, you get that economic advantage. Our nuclear refurbishments are Canada's largest infrastructure project. About half of that is being financed privately because the Bruce, uh, the Bruce Power, again, that's publicly owned, but privately operated. Um, but in any case, enormous economic benefit is accruing from this. But the nuclear industry has been quite sheepish, um, not fighting for their interests. And I mean, that's, this is such an interesting phenomenon. Like, Robert, I'm an eMERGE doc. My background is, you know, I was a consulting physician at this, the Canadian Center for Victims of Torture. I was, you know, I founded one of the first seasonal agricultural migrant worker clinics, right? I was a, cor a health correspondent for Canada's largest Indigenous newspaper. Did I ever think I would be doing what I'm doing now? No, but I asked myself, you know, what is the, you know, how can I match my resources and abilities to make the biggest difference in the world? You know, and there's this joke, you know, be vegan, you can save a ton of carbon every year, don't drive your car, you can save two, you know, you can reduce your carbon footprint by two tons. I am so proud to be joining, you know, Maddie Hilly, Mark Nelson, Paris Ortiz Wines, um, Isabel Bemicky, 
you know, all of the people that made saving Byron, Dresden, Diablo Canyon, like it is such a mark of honor to join them. And I mean, we joke sometimes, you know, cause we end up probably flying a lot, but you know, this whole offset, you know, it gets a bit silly kind of dividing up the, the tons of CO2, but like, it's mind boggling. Like we're keeping 8 million tons of CO2 out of the air every year. That's 8 million transatlantic flights. Um, it's, it's an amazingly wonderful thing, uh, to save a nuclear plant. And, you know, the trend right now is we're saving the things, even even in Germany, for God's sakes, because I mean, this, is, this is another thing, Robert, right? You know, Russia, I mean, it took a blowing up a pipeline for Germany to finally come to its senses and say, you know, I mean, you can't hold these reactors in standby when their core is depleted. They have to keep running. OK, but imagine Europe cut off from all, you know, all of its fossil. Imagine, you know, who knows who did it, but say it was someone allied to the Americans and the Russians blow up the Norwegian Polish pipeline, or there's, you know, more of that kind of activity. They're going to keep every nuclear plant running as long as they possibly can. I mean, in the end of the day, you need energy. Um, so people are coming to their senses. I'm rambling, but you get the point. Well, so uh, those are all uh, uh, key things you're talking about. I th uh, and, and, the Germans coming around after the the sabotage of Nord Stream, I think, is it, maybe this was the catalyst that brings uh, Ontario power generation around. But I also just did a, a couple of quick analysis, uh, quick uh, looks at some numbers. You know how I love to do comparisons. Um, Pickering is a big plant, six six reactors in operation, three point one gigawatts of capacity, twenty four terawatt hours produced per year. So for comparison, Canada produces about five terawatt hours from solar. I've been in Canada. It's not a big solar place. Uh, so five X all roughly five X all Canadian solar and two thirds of the wind output, about 35 terawatt hours per year from wind, according to the latest BP numbers. So by itself, Pickering is producing 24 terawatt hours. I mean, that's two thirds of your wind output and it's base load. It's a, it's a not going to stop producing if the weather changes, right, which is the problem with wind. Um, but in terms of the energy, as I look at this, and I'm not from Canada, I haven't been in following, I've followed it, but not in anything like the depth that you have, that maybe this is just one of those moments where the regulators, the bureaucrats are saying, ah, whew, you know what, this is about energy security and we need a big dose of energy realism. We're going to keep this thing open. I mean, it, it, was it all of these factors? And, and, and you know, I know you want no. to acknowledge some other people, but can you, can you even know if people at OPG said there was one thing that made us change our minds? Well, I have my I have my hypothesis, and I'll get to that in just a second. Okay, sure. Um, two things, you know, in terms of that output, you know, Ontario, we're the, we're the France of North America in terms of you know having almost as much nuclear as part of our generating mix as the French, probably more because the French nuclear fleet's not operating well right now. Right. Um, we tried to become the Germany of North America. We had this Green Energy Act. All said and done, by 2040, we will have spent $60 billion on subsidies. And that was under Pickering, the McGinty government, right? The McGinty government put that in place, right? Pickering produces more power than every single one of the 3,273 grid-connected wind and solar projects in Ontario. Okay. <laughs> we could right, so mention that with Ontario numbers. I stated the whole Canadian, all of yeah, Canada, yeah, yeah. which is a very big place. Okay. Right. Exactly. Um Wow, what was I going to say next? Sorry. Um, Your hypothesis. Wind, wind about about 25% of our wind production in Ontario is curtailed. because so we don't need the goddamn stuff when it produces. So our peak demand is summer. We have disgusting, hot, humid, you know, two weeks of 40 degrees, you know, 90% humid. I don't know, maybe I'm exaggerating, but like you would kill for a breeze to blow some of that sweat off your forehead. It doesn't show up. Right. So, you know, if you look at our wind profiles, it's extraordinary. Almost nothing in our hottest months, July to early September. OK, goes gangbusters in the spring and fall. You know, that's when our grid demands about 10 gigawatts. Right. Somewhere we're peaking up at 26 gigawatts. You know, we do our outages and maintenance on our nuclear plants in those shoulder seasons in the spring and fall. Right. Um, and we run gangbusters and Pickering set a site record, all six reactors going for 100 days straight right through our peak demand season. So you really can't make the comparison. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's an extraordinary thing that's, th that we do. You know, you were asking again, did, did, did saner minds prevail? We were at the ISO meetings, um, which were called um, as part of, you know, we have this group 
I call them the Ontario Green Air Alliance. Um, they got a lot of gas funding back in the day. Um, they wanted our coal fleet to be replaced by natural gas, interestingly enough, and are avidly anti-nuclear. Um, but they're uh, hats off to them. They're pretty effective organizers. They'd gotten 40 municipalities to demand that the Ontario government investigate a phase out of gas. Now, we don't use much gas, just for peaking in the summer again. Right. Um, but it did force the government to ask our independent electricity systems operator to look into this. Now, <laughs> we got on that call with them, the consultation call, and we said, how are you not modeling a refurbishment of Pickering when you're talking about trying to phase out gas? Because the whole reason gas is going to go from 7% to 30% is because you're shutting down this nuclear plant. Right. Right. They refused to do it. That was seven, eight months ago. Right. So, Robert, what made the difference? And I think, you know, we're going to have a Twitter spaces with Doomberg um, in the next week or two. Maddie, Mark and I, um, you know, the, the, the nuclear advocates cookbook, you know, how to save a nuclear plant. Um, but, you know, I want to take a moment, um, get emotional, uh, you know, and really pay my respects to Dylan Moon, um, who is the jack of all trades and has contributed so much to the success, uh, not only of my podcast, um, but Canadians for Nuclear Energy, truly a jack of all trades, you know, the audio engineer, um, you know, the editor, the, the sound master for the podcast does a lot of research, um, but also the researcher and writer of our report, Save Pickering, which was a 23 page policy report, um, heavily referenced, you know, absolutely stellar quality writing, incredible graphics, um, you know, without without Dylan, um, I'm not sure we would have saved this nuclear plant. Without that, you know, it, it, what, you know, in terms of Diablo Canyon, what did Gavin Newsom hold up in the air? He held that study. I'm forgetting, you know, it was about 76 scientists that, you know, did an analysis of Diablo Canyon. Right. If these policymakers, you know, Milton Friedman said this, right? In the middle of a crisis, you know, it's these policymakers are looking around for paper on the ground and they pick something up, right? What ideas are floating around in the middle of a crisis? And, you know, the ISO was forecasting a major crisis for us. You can't just take off a 3.1 gigawatt um, <laughs> base load power facility um, in the midst of electrification, in the midst right. of these electric arc furnaces coming on, right? right. And so they, you know, it is my belief, it is my belief that they picked up that report and it really has served as the template because what we were arguing for was extension and refurbishment. And remember, everyone was calling us crazy for this. You know, the nuclear establishment were saying cease and desist and this isn't good for nuclear and this is crazy. And we never gave up. And again, I mean, there's so many people to list in terms of, you know, who made this possible. You know, there were times when my faith wavered. Chris Adlam, um, who's just an encyclopedia of all things nuclear, despite being an IT professional by day. Um, you know, I don't want to name too many names because I'll leave so many people out. But, you know, it was really it took a village to save this plant. You're, you're going, um, Jesse. Um, uh, I've forgotten Jesse's last name. Jesse Friesten, the video man. Yeah. Jesse but Friesten, again, yeah. honestly, it's it's without that report, um, you know, and we're a very small group, uh, Canadians for Nuclear Energy, you know, bare bones budget. Um, I was able to, you know, divert some resources really from from the podcast. Um, and that's how Dylan was able to write this thing. But without someone with the writing skills um, to pull all of the great research we had together into a beautiful document. Um, and I'll tell you in a second and how it got into the hands of decision makers. Um, but, you know, the template that's being followed is the one that was laid out by us. And as of two months ago, it was not on the agenda at all. And it rapidly got on the agenda. And here we are, we're getting a life extension. And from what I'm telling, what I'm being told, this isn't just, you know, eh, let's see if it's possible. It's make it possible. That's kind of the directive. Um, and, you know, people at the Pickering Nuclear Station are saying, the workers have pep in their step. They're excited about this. You know, the kind of pride that goes into work when you think we've got a chance to save this thing. It's, it's amazing. So morale has been boosted. You know, it's just, it's such exciting times, Robert. You know, what's, I've thought about the nuclear plants and I've, I've been in, in, uh, at Indian point and I've seen a lot of industrial facilities. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in my dotage now, right? I'm 62. I can collect social security, but I've, I've been in the business of journalism for a long time and I've been in mines, I've been in factories of all kinds, but the nuclear plant that I went to, I, it was the most amazing because I, I, you know, comprehending the power density of it and comprehending the thing as a machine, right? And that mm -hmm, this machine mm -hmm. is the driver 
of society. And that's where I've thought lately about the idea of new, these nuclear plants, as, as our, our mutual friend Emmett Penny calls them, our industrial cathedrals, but they're mm-hmm. so, if you're going to have something that powers society, you have to freaking maintain it. You have to have mechanics, you have to have people, tradespeople there all the time that are making that machine work and, are ma- and maintaining it for the long term. And instead of putting up these flimsy, and I'm going to use that because it's the right word, a bunch of stuff that depends on the so, on the sun and the wind. No, we don't. We can't run society on something that can blow away. You need something that's durable that you can and that is going to be there when the chips are down, and that is a machine that is dirt, built not just for years but for decadal kind of time frames. And that's where I think this is such a. I, you know, I think, as I said, that we're at an inflection point at, uh, on nuclear and the momentum has been remarkable, the shift in just the last two years, and I would say even the last two months, and that it's just very heartening. And I, I you know, it's I know you, you're you not going to get all the credit and you shouldn't, but you you were in the vanguard here. And I so I congratulate you. I think it's just amazing, you know, and and, and add a boy. So I'm wanted to get that out of the way. So good. Good on you. Robert, you know, John Constable said something interesting, I think probably in both of our podcasts. He talked about Alexander the Great surging across Asia and coming across probably the Baku oil fields where petroleum was bubbling to the surface. Right. And Constable said, you know, he didn't have any, you know, distillation chemists, you know, petroleum engineers. He didn't have any diesel engines beyond lobbing it, you know, at his enemies as Greek fire. Right. Um, wasn't much use for the stuff, right? Right. Or maybe, you know, pitching a roof or something like that. These nuclear plants are miracles that transform rocks, very little rocks, magic rocks into an insane <laughs> amount of energy, right? Reliable, yeah. affordable, carbon-free, air pollution-free energy and vandalizing them, decommissioning them, shutting them down is it, it's an outright crime. Um, particularly in the context of the energy crisis. I mean, you know, you've spoken about this a lot, you know, Germany shutting down nuclear plants and then trying to, you know, not trying to, but outbidding poor countries on available fossil fuel resources, starving the global South, driving up prices to a level that they're unaffordable. I mean, it's, it's completely unforgivable. You, you mentioned kind of the human side of this. And I had Michael Schellenberger on recently after the Diablo Canyon victory. You know, right. what have we, we've been labeling, Heather Hoff and I have been labeling, you know, Diablo Canyon and Pickering as sister plants. But something that he said that really struck me was the failure of the nuclear industry is not to emphasize the human side, the human factor of the technology. Ultimately, mm. this is not about, you know, especially in communications, not about a picture of a valve or, a, you know, a steam generator or whatever else. This is a human story. You know, and it, it's it's an incredible culture of excellence that comes together to design these things, to build these things, to operate these things. You know, I'll be the first to admit nuclear is difficult, but, yeah. you know, I'm an optimist. I'm a humanist. We rise to that challenge. And again, I'm so bullish on nuclear in Ontario, you know, more than any other place in the West, because we have this active supply chain and active workforce intimately familiar with the can-do design we've never operated the can-do design better and you know you have, we're refurbishing and you have the on and you budget have the government and you have the government behind you i mean is this yeah. the, those 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 supply chains the workforce the government all of these things aligning which are, are remarkable uh you mentioned constable i'll interrupt because he said something else and maybe he said it on your podcast but he was here in austin we uh we uh, uh did some interviews with him or an interview with him for this documentary that i'm working on and he made a point that I'd never thought of before. He said, you know, when you look in nature, there are a lot of organisms that rely on the sun and on, mm-hmm. you know, things that come from the sun, the plants and, and so on. And there are algae and other things that, you know, um, there's nothing in nature that relies solely on the wind. The wind does not surpri- does, does not provide hmm. enough energy to any living organism Interesting. in nature. And I thought about that and I thought, just another reason why I hate those fuckers in the wind business. <laughs> I don't like them. I, I've made it clear I don't like the wind industry. They don't like me back. I'm okay with that. But mm. you can't run a modern society depending on the wind to blow. You just can't do it. You, it's, you, know, you, it, you can use some of it and you can store some of it, but you can't. That's why nuclear to me is so incredibly important because it is this engine for society. And that's what it is. It's a big ass heat engine and it needs 
a support and it needs nurturing and it needs constant inputs to make sure that mm -hmm. the engine keeps running. Uh, and, and if you do it, it's like a Toyota. It's going to run for hundreds of thousands of miles, but you got to take it to the mechanic and you got to maintain the damn thing. You know, at the, at the press conference, there was a reporter, you know, who was trying to, you know, harass the minister and said, listen, I've got like a 2010 Dodge Caravan. It's end of life. Right. And, you know, the thoughts that came to my mind are, you know, did you take that Dodge Caravan to the mechanic every 5,000 miles or maybe every 1,000 miles, right? Did you right. change the belts when there was the slightest imperfection in them? Did you get an oil change, you know, every 1,000 miles? Um, oh, and did you drive it like a granny, obeying all of the speed <laughs> limits, going 90 well, in, in uh, you know, 60 miles an hour in the right lane of the highway, avoiding any sudden braking, stopping, going? You know, right. this is, you can't make these category errors. And this is right. the, this is what we see all over the place. You know, this misapplication of Moore's laws to renewables, you know, solar is going to get infinitely cheaper, essentially obeying things like Moore's law or storage is going to get infinitely better. You know, it's going to double every year in its effectiveness. You know, it's personal for me, the, the, this, the wind industry here in Ontario, right? We're going to have spent again, $60 billion in subsidies. We have to poke holes in this idea that wind and solar are cheap. They provide incredibly low value energy again in Ontario, completely out of phase with right. demand when it comes to wind and listen, $10 billion to refurbish Pickering. We should have done it in 2010 or been planning for it better late than never. That is one sixth of the cost of all of this wind and solar, which has provided very little value for that investment. And let's face it, where are those solar panels getting made? Where are those wind turbines, turbines getting made? I mean, not really in Europe anymore. It's all gone to China, you right. know? So, you know, it, it, it frustrates me in, in a multitude of ways, Robert. <laughs> yeah, no, agreed. Um, and, and the other part of this that I think for me is personal is just how, how it's negatively affecting consumers. I'm pro natural gas, but in the U S and in particular here in Texas, we made the grid too reliant on gas. And now I just checked Henry hub, uh, gas is today is at $7. Well, you know, two years ago, it was at $2. Well, but it's yeah. not $2 anymore. And now because we've made the grid so heavily reliant on gas and we've retired a lot of coal in Texas and the U S we don't have that that lower price BTUs in the form of molecules going into the plant. So we get higher cost electrons coming out because mm -hmm. we're burning more expensive fuel. But I want to talk for just a second, because um, uh, not only does Pickering provide 14% of the province's electricity, but I wanted to, uh, I know we've talked about this before, but I want to hit it again, uh, the issue of cobalt 60. Um, this is a critical medical isotope and Ontario Power Generation talks about this in uh, uh, on their website, uh, opg.com, I believe, um, that Pickering alone provides 20% of the North American supply of cobalt 60. Uh, tell me what, uh, that's a medical isotope. You're a doctor. Tell me what that does. What is cobalt 60? Cobalt 60 is a very strong gamma emitter. Glows bright blue with the Trenkov effect when they take it out of the reactor. Mm -hmm. In Canada, we can produce it in enormous volumes because we can put, um, you know, basically a rod of cobalt 59 um, into this neutron rich environment. It soaks up all those neutrons, turns into the isotope uh, cobalt 60, and then it's used to sterilize many different things around the world. But I'll focus on the medical side. The cobalt 60 that we make at Pickering and at Bruce Power sterilizes 40% of the world's single-use medical devices. Mm. Of the world's single-use right. medical devices. That's everything from, you know, the IV cannula that goes in your arm if you end up in the ICU, the endotrate, the breathing tube that might get placed, joint replacements, you know, anything that you need to be absolutely sterile. And let me tell you, <laughs> we want everything to be sterile that we're putting right. inside people's bodies. So, you know, can do reactor technology enables modern healthcare around the world. And that's yet another reason why closing Pickering was such a dumb idea. You know, and frankly, it is frustrating that it took such an effort to bring the industry around on this, to bring the trade association around on this. You know, again, better late than never. I am so glad to not be, you know, in low level friction um, with such a large section of the nuclear industry. Um, it's wonderful that we're all 
pulling in the same direction now. Um, there is work to be done still. Um, we do need to get that refurbishment, um, you know, happening. That's going to take a, a, a mixture of the brilliant people working at OPG, the engineers, the project managers, um, looking at, you know, the feasibility, how we can do this economically, how we can take those lessons we've learned from refurbishments at other sites where we're coming in, uh, you know, before time and under budget. Right. Um, but we're all pulling in the same direction now. And, you know, that is an enormous uh, source of pride for me and my organization. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm exhausted, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled. Yeah, well, that's great. It really is. Uh, um, you know, what was it? Uh, who was it? Jane Goodall or I forgot that uh, the people say that only, you know, one person can't change the world. Well, something like, well, it, it takes one person without that. I don't, I don't know what that, that, that quote is, but you know what I'm talking yeah, about, yeah. Um, that there's, if, if there's commitment, there's a possibility, right? And you were committed. And so good on you. Um, so, but I, I'm just curious about that technique that you said that the neutron rich environment about the, con so mm -hmm. American reactors, the regular uh, pressurized water reactors can't produce isotopes or, or cobalt 60, or, or can they be trained to do it? Or they need different technology? What are the, what is the, what is the difference about the can do that allows it to produce these isotopes? I'm going to be going on a slight limb here, but I think I got it, uh, okay. Robert. All right, go I don't ahead. know why I keep blundering on your name. I want to call you Roger for some reason. Yeah, so <laughs> so he needs I think more what coffee it is, or some sleep, one or the other, oh I guess. Oh, my God. Give me a, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the calandria, which is, you know, the, the it's not a pressure vessel, but it's what contains all of those horizontally oriented pressure tubes, is a relatively low pressure environment. The pressure okay. is more sort of within the pressure tubes, hence pressure tubes, right. um, which is incidentally why Candus are an incredibly safe design. You don't have all the fuel able to melt at once. If you have a cracked pressure tube, um, there's a leak into a low pressure, heavy water moderator um, that's there in a huge volume. You have right. su like it's such a tolerant uh, environment. Uh, for the worst things you can throw at this reactor. In any case, because it's a low pressure environment in that calandria, you can drop down these cobalt 60. Um, I think they look like control rods essentially, but you can drop those down very easily into that relatively low pressure heavy water moderator where neutrons are zipping around. And basically, you know, the way that uh, the experts have explained it to me, you're essentially putting energy into, you know, a, a kind of radioactively inert substance and turning it into something that's incredibly energetic. And then we harness that energy to sterilize 40% of the world's single use medical devices. Um, you know, also true. food irradiation, right. the, the amount, to, I don't know, I just to get, I, I think it's really important to illustrate the big numbers, you know, with a narrative, but that's enough to sterilize 20 billion pieces of PPE. You know, at the height of the pandemic, my God, we were going through a lot of gear. Yeah. Um, so you can't understate the value. Um, and, you know, one of one of the missions of my group is really to elevate and celebrate the Candu reactor. Um, there's so many reasons why we should be not only refurbishing, but building new Candus. Um, phenomenal design, incredibly safe, produces the medical isotopes, you know, and critically, you know, the supply chain readiness and human factors trumps design. You know, we've, we had a lot of promises with AP 1000. You know, it was supposed to be built in three or four years, snapped together like Lego. Um, you know, the EPR may be a little harder to build, but, you know, these were beautiful designs. The engineers, you just were so excited to take their blueprints out. You know, they didn't have them fully finished when they started building. But, you know, but the supply chain wasn't there. It wasn't equipped. It wasn't skilled. You know, some of the big modular components delivered at Vogel didn't fit together, right? So we have that advantage. And I'm so excited. You know, the next push, I think, is, you know, we need to get that SMR or SMRs built. Um, exciting to be an exporter of, of that uh, technology that's highly sought after around the world. Um, but listen, let's face it. The Ontario grid is huge. We're, we're forecasting increased demand. Um, those refurb workers are going to be done in the late 2020s, I guess, with the Pickering refurbishment, the 2030s. We need to plan now to be building new can -dos. We have a licensed site at Darlington for 4,800 megawatts. From what mm. I understand, the current plan is to build 1,200 megawatts of SMRs. 
And Robert, let me tell you, well, and that was it the, is incredibly and that was the decision difficult. in March, right, by OPG that they they were going to work with GE Hitachi on that on that first grid scale SMR, right? That that was the now that's yeah. in progress, right? That's what's been announced, from what I understand from my sources. The plan is to just put four SMRs there on a site licensed for forty eight hundred megawatts, and we need those megawatts, and we have workers and a supply chain that's teed up to build new Candu that know the technology inside out. So you know. That's a, another minor source of friction, you know, and, and it's so exciting, you know, at Canadians for Nuclear Energy to be this outsider, you know, little David in the David and Goliath sort of struggle group to win these victories, but also I think to really influence the whole sector. You know, people are so excited. Um, they were excited, like a huge chunk of people in nuclear wanted the refurbishment. But the way the nuclear industry works is it's very, you know, this is the party line, everybody tow it. We can't take any risks, we can't have any disagreements, right? And similarly on the SMR front, this is what we've chosen, you know, no mm -hmm. objections. You have 76,000 people, you know, this is a diverse group of people who are very smart with a diverse group of opinions. Sure. And so Canadians for Nuclear Energy is able to, you know, be a little bit insurgent and say, you know what, I, again, my, my obsession is the nuclear secret sauce. How do we do this hard thing? How do we build nuclear plants on budget and on time in order to do everything that nuclear can do? And the lessons come back to supply chain and human factors, Trump design, but can do is a brilliant design. Yeah. So I'm kind of showing my cards, but you know, that's, that's the next sort of struggle that we see on the horizon. And I think again, um, there's so many people within the Canadian nuclear industry who are on board with that, but they haven't had like a champion to get behind. But, you know, we've shown that we can completely upend and change the narrative. You know, again, OPG is, they sound incredibly enthusiastic about this refurbishment. And that's, that's a change in tune. I'm so excited for it. You know, the Canadian Nuclear Association as well is now very enthusiastic about this. Um, you it's know, exciting. people are coming out of woodwork. I'll, I'll stop you for a second because I think, you know, as you're, you're and, and I know I can tell you're excited and you're going to keep going if I don't stop you. <laughs> um, but I'll quote Alex Epstein, who, you know, has had success pushing his his ideas, but he's he has this line, I'm not for all of the above, I'm for all of the best. And I think That's that that line. is a really important thing to say, right? No, I'm not for all of the above. And mm. I'm in the same camp. I'm No, I am not for carpeting uh, large swaths of America with wind, wind turbines and solar panels. I am absolutely opposed, 100%. Mm, rural America mm. has a voice here and you spreading all your, 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 your renewable crap all over their counties and they they don't want it. And they, and they've told, they've made that clear. Um, mm -hmm. and yet, uh, of course, there's just a lot of money behind, uh, uh, those, those industries and, and they're, you know, congratulations to them. They got massive new subsidies with the, uh, inflation reduction act. Um, so Chris, we've been talking for a while and I, you know, I like to keep my podcast at less than an, an hour or less, but I think we've covered a lot of the things around Pickering and I, that was why I wanted to do this special uh, podcast with you because of this news that came out on Wednesday, September 28th. Today's the 30th. Um, so we've talked about how the nuclear conversation has changed. Uh, we talked about isotopes, um, but I'm going to ask you the same questions I always ask. So what are you reading or have you had any time to read lately? What are, what's, uh, what, what's at the top of your list? Yeah, you know what, Robert, it's, a, it's an apt question. Decouple just launched um, Decouple Reads, which is uh -huh. a book club. Um, and we're just building a community around that on our Patreon. Um, so we are work we're reading Václav Smil's uh, How the World Really Works. Right. Um, I've read uh, Peter Zihan's book, uh, most recent book. I'm, I'm going to butcher the title, but you In, remember it. The World is Just the Beginning, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm really into Jonathan Haid right now. Mm-hmm coddling of the american mind um and his book again sorry i'm sleepless here but the the book about um you know moral taste buds um k k killing me i can't remember the name off the top of my head right now but you know that one is is just so critically important you know and again i'm i'm i come from a background on the political left um and the modus operandi of the political left is that we just have to convince all the stupid people that they're wrong um and i guess if if you know the hard left ever gets uh, you know, full power, they might just kind of eliminate people that disagree with them. Um, but ultimately, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat, not in the sense of your, your political party, but we need to all pull together in society. What Jonathan Haidt says that I think is the most fascinating is that there's kind of a collective moral evolution, you know, starting as we did in an evolutionary perspective in these small hunter gatherer communities, we needed people with a variety of different moral taste buds and biases and ways of seeing the world. And isn't it remarkable that in every society around the world, 
you kind of have a political left and a political right. You have people that are conservative, people that are liberal, people that are mm -hmm. hippie freaks, et cetera. There's a need for all of those folks in the human family to steer society. Um, and, you know, that's been very influential. And in terms of, you know, my, my theory of change now, um, you know, initially when I was doing this pro-nuclear stuff, you argue with the people that argue back with you the most loudly. I was trying to convince environmentalists and Green Party people waste of time. Right. Um, and so, you know, I've been working pragmatically across the political spectrum and what's beautiful, I'll just maybe close with this. What's beautiful about this, this Pickering thing is there's a strong argument on the left. You know, these are publicly owned, um, assets, mm -hmm. you know, with, you know, huge workforces with the highest union density of any sector, right? These are just transition jobs. The right. left should be all over this. The political right's all over it, you know, thankfully now because it, it creates a healthy business environment. Um, and, you know, the center, well, you know, there's lots of reasons they can jump on as well. I won't, I won't go into detail there, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about a kind of pragmatic politics that can, that can win on this. Is it perfect? Does everyone get what they want? No, but um, there you go. Those, <laughs> those are my books and a little tangent uh, on top of it for you. <laughs> Well, see, I was going to ask you about what gives you hope, but I think you've already answered that question. There we I think go. That you've, you've really addressed that, uh, the coming together of different political factions around uh, nuclear energy as a, as a platform that stands on its own, that crosses the political divide and deserves broad public support because of the massive benefits it provides to society. And I think that that absolutely is the case. So I am, I'm right on that same page with you. Well, let's stop there then, since we're in, in uh, complete agreement here and we, uh, you're kind of in the stunned <laughs> silence there for a moment, So, which I've never seen before, Kiefer, but that's okay. <laughs> so my guest has been uh, my friend, uh, who I'm quite proud of, Chris Kiefer. He's the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. You can find them at c4ne.ca. You can follow his Decouple podcast on all the fine podcast outlets and on YouTube. Uh, Chris, congratulations again. Thanks for coming on this episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. One last shameless plug, uh, Robert. Oh, there's um, more? No, wait on a minute. You're done. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> on c4ne.ca, there is a great big donate button. Um, we really do thrive on on those donations. We've achieved an incredible amount. We just saved a nuclear plant. Um, you know, I know your podcast audience is quite international, um, but we are in Ontario, a real beacon of hope uh, for energy reality and sensibility. Um, so if anyone's able to support us, um, that is how we are able to operate and hire the great people we do, like Dylan Moon, who produced this report. Um, you can also check out that report if you like there. Um, my shameless plug is now over. Okay. All right. Well, we'll end there. Chris, thanks again for coming on the podcast. And to all you in podcast land, thanks for tuning in this time. See you next time.